please welcome up Pixel Q's Mary Lou Jepson. Thanks, Brady. Um, Samir touched on the problem I've been working on for the last five years, and that is 1.2 billion people with access to computing, and the rest of the 6.57 billion without. What do we do about it? It's a big problem, and that's what I've been working on. And, and the way it can affect somebody's life to have access to it is captured in this quote in an email I got from a kid in Nigeria two years ago who got a prototype of the one laptop per child XO laptop that I designed. And he said, as it says there, I love my laptop more than my life. And I thought, boy, that's, that's a problem. But I started talking to him and, and um, you know, it's the only thing he's ever owned and it's the only chance he's ever had. And there's a lot of kids like Bad Miss and there's a lot of adults like Bad Miss and we can give them a better chance and that's what I and many of us have been trying to do. About five years ago, I was at Intel and I was designing um, really expensive, really high-end HDTVs that less than 1% of the world could afford. And I thought, do we really need another HDTV? And we, do we really need me to design it? And I thought, at the same time, you know, this is 2003, the dot-com, the telecom blowout had happened, and the only people making money still in telecom were those providing goods and services to the next billion and the next billion to get them telephones. And I thought, you know, how do I use my skills to do something like that? I didn't know a lot about cell phones, but I knew a lot about screens. And as much as cell phones do, the world's information is digital. It really is more and more so. The web, news, all of that is digital. And now, you know, five years later, we have 10 million books scanned. That was the last bastion of what was offline. It's now online and accessible, thanks to many different organizations. But if you look, I mean, the rich people, the rich countries have access to digital information, and the poor countries don't, the so-called digital divide. Cell phones go some of the way, but not all the way. You need computers. And so if we couple with that, just a startling fact that today, 97% of adolescents live in the developing world. 3% of adolescents use, live in the developed part of Europe, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, right? That's, that's it, 97%. So if you want to change the world, if you want to give these kids, most of the world, our future, a chance, we need to figure out a way to give these kids a chance. And one way is if we can get the cost of computing and the access to computing down. So I started in 2005 with Nicholas Negroponte, an organization called One Laptop Per Child. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Craig Barrett, Michael Dell all said it was impossible, it would never work, thought it was a joke. That got us press. Um, I came up with a design, an architecture, an idea um, to make a laptop, somehow convinced the large-scale manufacturers in the world, largely in Taiwan, to make it with me. They joined the effort. We got it through prototype. We did lots of trials with it um, and got it into mass production. And in fact, I snuck this photograph right when we were starting mass production the first day. I'd fallen asleep on the floor, which is a, a usual thing one does when they're working around the clock. And this is about four in the morning. And here this dream that everybody thought said was impossible was happening. And here the boxes were ready to go out to the kids. And really the key thing is a million children um, now have laptops across the developing world that otherwise would not in 30 different countries. This happens to be, uh, I think, Nigeria, but all over the world, one million laptops. So great, um, there's a billion kids, but a million is a good start. But what we started, and in my time um, traveling, mostly in Asia these days, to continue this, what we started was, was maybe an avalanche. Every time I meet with the CEO of a big uh, lap laptop company, they tell me that they studied um, my design. 
of the OLPCXO, which is great. Um, so the netbook effect, the small laptop effect, has been even larger. Uh, the predictions for netbook sales in 2008 we started in 2007 just with the OLPC XO that shipped about half a million units. And with all of the, 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 um, the industries, netbooks, the small, inexpensive laptops, the idea being, you know, who cares, you know, no offense to anybody from a CPU company, who cares what CPU is inside of it? Do we need a gazillion gigahertz or do we just need a low cost, low power machine? that's portable, that doesn't break, those batteries last a long time. I vote for the, the latter, not the gazillion gigahertz machine, and so do a lot of other people. So last year, before the world economic crisis started to happen really in a bad way, when the banks went out of business in September, the analysts predict we'd ship, we would ship sort of globally for netbooks about 8 million units, and we didn't hit that because of the economic crisis. We rounded out the year when, you know, volumes were down for everybody, factories were being shuttered, lots of layoffs. We rounded out the year shipping not 8 million units, but 17 million units. It's had a landscape change to the laptop industry, and netbooks are predicted to ship about 50 million units this year. So, Here's sort of how I think about, you know, going back to how I was five years ago, or even worse, when I used to make holographic TVs, is I think, you know, what a lot of us maybe do is sort of, you know, very high-end, very expensive, high-tech research at the sort of top of the pyramid. And what we tried to do at One Laptop Per Child, and what we're trying to do at Pixel Chi, my new company, is see if we can innovate at the bottom of the pyramid. Because if you pull it off, if you really pull it off, then you can extend the base of the pyramid and the height and the area instantaneously. And it makes me feel like the way a lot of people do, or the way I used to do high-end, high-tech research, it's sort of like trickle-down economics. It might someday get to the people, maybe, but it'll take 10, 20 years, and why not just work at the bottom of the pyramid? Because if you can get it to work, wow, it just takes off like wildfire, and you know, I'm, I'm completely hooked. Um, in order to get that to work, as I mentioned, um, it's not about the CPU anymore. It's not about a gazillion gigahertz. The key to making a low-cost laptop for the developing world Cost is really important. More important than cost is lowering the power. About half of the world, in very rough numbers, lives without steady access to electricity. When the, the electricity is on is more rare than when the electricity is off. And for that, you really have to think about how to design something that can be human powered or solar powered, animal powered, water powered, you know, some kind of alternative to to mains power off of the wall. And so we designed uh, the lowest power, lowest cost laptop ever made, but the lowest power laptop ever made. A one watt laptop in its lowest power consumption mode, which is more than 10x lower than the next, the next laptop up. And that was by sort of looking at A, the most expensive, and B, the most power hungry component, and redesigning around that. It's the screen. The screen's the most expensive and the most power-hungry component, not the CPU, um, not, not the motherboard. And so if you think about that, you're spending a lot of effort to update over a million pixels 60 times a second. And if you think of the iron and the juice that you need to do that, you sort of quickly decide, you know, why don't you just self-refresh the screen? Right now, we're, um, you know, if this was on your computer, you'd be looking at a computer screen with no pixels changing at all. And so you'd have to ask yourself the question, why in every laptop in this room is the CPU on? Is the motherboard on? Is the fan on? What, what is all that doing? Why don't you just turn it off until you get a keyboard event or a packet comes over the internet? A pixel changes on the screen. I mean, the way we interact with our computers is through the screen and the audio. There could be little green men inside of the computer. A lot of people wouldn't know. Um, 
it's human computer interaction. We see and hear it. And so if you think about designing a laptop or a computer with that perspective, you come up with a very different design. It's environmentally a lot more sound. It's 10x lower power consumption. You need to use less batteries. And by using less juice, you don't need the toxic components that are often in laptops. You don't need electrolytic capacitors whose lifetime is lower. So we also created the greenest laptop ever made, um, EP, first EP Gold Award or somewhere like that. They wanted to make a new category for us, but uh, um, EP, basically the, the keys to designing for environmental use are just things you would do naturally for the developing world. You lower the power consumption, you make a long life machine, you make it field repairable, and you lower the, the power count. So the screen really leads in that. So meanwhile, while all this was happening, I spun out of OLPC to sort of decided to, you know, make components that everybody could use as netbooks were sort of catching fire and um, the Dow and all the other markets were crashing. Um, so the good news about that is uh, component prices are half of what they were six months ago to make low cost stuff. It's a lot easier now than it was two years ago. So we can use that. But the key to doing that is using the factories of the world that exist. A lot of people, when they design new things, they want to, well, particularly in displays, you want to invent the new molecule, manufacturing prices, fa manufacturing processes, new factories, and so forth. But if you look at the display manufacturing infrastructure, which dwarfs that of silicon now, it's it's huge, and if you, if you plot the different types of factories on a bar graph with, you know, how much capacity they have, you can't see anything else other than TFT LCD. TFT stands for thin film transistor LCD. It's, it's what's in all your laptops, desktops, um, on the LCD screens, HDTVs, and so forth. The problem with getting um, to use these factories is convincing somebody to let you design new pixel layouts, new transistor layouts for the, the glass and the sort of five, six layers on the bottom. There's just a couple metal layers, an amorphous silicon layer, and so forth. Not even Apple gets into them. I, I took no for, for years and years, and finally, at one laptop per child, convinced somebody to say yes. Took that opportunity, put my foot in the door, got in there, um, finished the spec, and went from spec to mass production ready in six months and shipped a million of them with greater than 95% yield. And that was enough, enough to convince everybody else, now that I'm at a for-profit company called Pixel Chi, to let me use their factories. Now, a lot of them are shuttered right now. Um, there are some delays for new products because the factories are closed. A lot of companies are going through their first layoffs ever in 50 years. But um, we have access and we're making some pretty cool new products. Um, and the basic principle is, you know, what you have in your laptop right now or even your cell phone is basically a small HDTV. But you know, some people actually want to read off of their screens, and reading isn't the same as watching TV. You know, watching TV, you sit on the couch, the TV is far away. A computer screen is, you know, 12 to 24 inches away from your face. You want it to be readable. Why not be able to read it outside? You could use it outside. You know, the number, why not go for higher resolution? The number one reason people prefer to read on printed page rather than on the screen is resolution. And paper has about 10 times the resolution of the screens on your laptops. You also want a paper white state. You don't want to stare into a flashlight all the time when you're reading, which is what you do with a backlight on full blast. That causes eye strain and that makes it hard to read. So we're designing screens that um, fix these problems. You still have sort of the 3T screen, which we haven't really talked about publicly, but it's coming online this year as a run-in change to the netbooks. We're making 10-inch screens as our first product. And you have your HDTV mode like normal, full color saturation, watch your DVDs, whatever. 
but two other modes, an e-paper mode where you turn the screen totally off, the backlight totally off, and you know that when you turn down the backlight, your batteries last longer. Well, when you turn it off, they last even longer. So a very low power paper white, black and white, very high resolution mode. It's three times the resolution of the regular full color mode. And then sort of an in-between mode where it's, you've got color, it's not fully saturated. It's a lot, a lot like the XO laptop mode, which has a desaturated color, still color, but higher, higher resolution for reading. So that's coming. We've got funding. Getting funding during this um, economic crisis has been interesting. Spent a lot of time on Sand Hill Road and came to the conclusion they're kind of just open for show. They're not funding anything. Anyway, we're closing our, our round after um, some struggle. But um, uh, there's a, a million dollars left in it that we're keeping open in case anyone's interested, talk to me after the, the talk. Um, the screen that I'm describing might sound a lot like the screen in the XO that had a, a sunlight readable paper white mode that's black and white and a full color mode with a backlight on. But it, it's better, it's beyond that. It's a fully saturated color and the reflectivity, and that's the key thing for paper, uh, so for, for e-paper modes, the reflectivity rivals that of the electrophoretics. Another thing we're working on, we've had a lot of pull for, uh, for um, actually from India first and then other countries. People want TVs even if they don't have power. They want low power TV, sort of an HD TV for sub $100 and sub 10 watts that can be human powered. And we figured out a way to do that, and we're working on that. That'll come probably next year, but um, that's in process. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I think I'd like to close with just quoting something that uh, one of the top executives at one of the top laptop companies in the world told me um, last, last fall. And he sort of said, you know, in hardware, the CPU wars are over. Nobody cares, okay, unless, sorry if you're from one of the CPU companies, maybe people care, but, you know, in, in this is what he said, not me, it's the screen wars now, and, and really, I think with the iPhone, you know, you hold an iPhone, it's basically a screen, nobody really, well, we know, but when, the average user doesn't know much is in, inside of it, it's just a screen, and that, that's really where we see the future of hardware going, again, CPU wars are over, it's, the screen wars are, are starting. So thank you for your time. And um, thank you.